Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's 11 o'clock sharp, so we are going to get started. Welcome uh, to Managing and Monitoring Muscalinge, the webinar. So my name is Delana Arnold. I'm the Educations Program Manager for the Georgian Bay Biosphere Reserve. Um, I just want to thank you all for taking some time out of your day to join us. We're going to jump right in. Um, at this point, I think most of us have done a Zoom webinar in 2020, but just in case not, I'm going to um, point out a few features. At the bottom, if you move your mouse, a little toolbar should appear. For me, it's at the bottom. It might be on the side for some of you, depending on your device. Um, you'll see something that says Q&A. So if you have questions at any point during the webinar, um, I ask that you put them into the Q&A. Um, we will see them and we'll be able to answer them either um, in the live webinar or we can message you an answer. So we also have today set up a few polls that we're gonna do um, close to the beginning. Uh, they're kind of a fun little thing and I'll show you what they look like. I'm gonna launch one right now. So we'd like to know where is everyone joining us from today? What municipality is your seasonal or permanent residence? You can um, select your answer and we'll just allow a couple seconds um, for people to do this. There's still a few people joining us as well. maybe about four more seconds almost everyone has voted all right so um, now i'm going to show you the results so we have a lot of people joining us from the archipelago and over half of the people are joining us or at least uh, outside of Perry Sound muskoka districts so welcome everybody um all right Stop sharing the results. All right. Now, as a couple more people um, trickle into the webinar, uh, I'm just gonna talk about a few other things. So we will be recording today's session and uploading it to the YouTube channel. A link to the video and some other resources um, that will be mentioned today will be circulated to you by email tomorrow. Um, also note that we're gonna turn our cameras off during the presentation. So if you can't see us, don't worry. We're not supposed to be seen. <laughs> um, and I'd also like to share a little bit with you about the Georgian Bay Biosphere. So we are one of 18 UNESCO World Biospheres in Canada. Our region is ecologically unique with the largest freshwater archipelago on earth. Um, the Biosphere stretches 200 kilometers from the Severn River in the south to the French River in the north and it was designated in 2004. So we are a registered charity with an office in Perry Sound, and we rely on grants, partnerships, and donations to be able to do conservation and education work. And since 2014, we've had an active partnership with the Township of the Archipelago um, to provide environmental programming to ratepayers. So this has included a range of things from water quality monitoring, um, forest health work, guided hikes, kids programming, and in 2020, it includes webinars. So most people now have joined us and I would now like to acknowledge the land before we begin. So the Georgian Bay Biosphere is situated within the treaty territories of Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850 and the Williams Treaty of 1920. It is located on Anishinaabek territory. Our organization under UNESCO acknowledges the rights of indigenous peoples in this territory and we work towards respectful and reciprocal relationships as we are all caretakers of the land. So I will now turn things over to our presenter for today, Arunas Laskowskis, who is management biologist with the Upper Great Lakes Management Un Unit. Uh, welcome and thank you, Arunas. Thank you. And good late morning to all those who have a passion for piscatorial pursuits, particularly as they relate to the Noble Muscalange. So hopefully you can all hear me okay. If not, just send us a notice through the Q&A and I'll just uh, get things started here. Um, I'll just get things started here and uh, see if I can advance the slide. There we go. So um, 
I will be presenting on managing and monitoring muscalunch populations in Eastern Georgian Bay and the North Channel of Lake Huron, a 20 year retrospective and beyond. But before I get into the presentation, I'm going to shut off my video feed and I will advance to my next slide and talk a bit about myself. Not that it's really necessary. My name is Arunas Laskauskas, and I am a biologist with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry with the Upper Great Lakes Management Unit and have been with the unit since 1992. You can see my academic credentials with the University of Guelph. And you can see a photo of me a few weeks ago up at the top right. That was my COVID look up until a few weeks ago, and I've had to domesticate myself so I could uh, integrate into society a little bit better. So I've toned down the wild look. And I just wanna spend the next little while talking about my involvement with our Muskie Monitoring and Assessment Program. I've been involved with this program since the mid 1990s. And, uh, I'm gonna to try to share some of the insights that uh, we've been able to garner over that period of time into this very unique top um, predator in the Lake Huron, Eastern Georgian Bay, North Channel area. So before I continue on, we have a bit of a pop quiz. So I will defer. The questions start out easy and then get a little more challenging, I think. Um, so we just want to know what brought everyone here today to a webinar on muskie. Maybe you've caught multiple in your life. Maybe you caught one. Maybe you've always just tried to catch one. Or you just love fishing or fish. Maybe you're not supposed to be here and you don't know what's happening. So again, I'll probably allow about 10 seconds just for everybody to pick what applies to them in the pool. And that's almost everybody. All right, two more seconds if you haven't voted. Okay, 10 seconds. Let's have a look at this. So most people just love fishing probably just love fish. No one's in the wrong webinar. And a couple of people have caught multiple in their life. So that's awesome. All right. I think it was back over to you, Arunas. Sure. There we go. So Georgian Bay, North Channel, that littoral coastline provides the basis for supporting species like a top predator like muscalunch. This slide just shows you some of the diversity of habitat types that are found in this area. The myriad islands, over 30,000 islands and embayments, and in particular coastal wetlands. Muscalunge are an obligate wetland spawner and require healthy wetlands in order to successfully reproduce. And along that eastern coast of Georgian Bay and throughout the North Channel, we have ample suitable habitat that supports this species. And as a result, the area is renowned for producing trophy-sized muscalunge. This slide shows two rather large specimens caught by anglers. The one on the left is the current Canadian angling record muscalunge at 65 pounds, caught by Ken O'Brien in 1981 or 82, and um, it was caught I guess I can't tell you where it was caught because we do have a quiz question related to that. It was caught somewhere in Georgian Bay. And beside it is uh, 
the Martin Williamson fish, which was uh, close to 62 pounds, and it was caught in 2001. So about 20 years ago for the Martin Williamson fish, and about 40 years ago for the Ken O'Brien fish. So as I said, the area is renowned for producing trophy-sized muscalunge and is uh, considered a mecca for producing these large fish. Ah, we're into the next pop quiz. And I think we have a couple that we were gonna do here, correct? Yeah. I think we're gonna try to do the remaining ones. Okay. So these are really just to get everyone uh, thinking about muskie, get them into the brain. So our first question is, um, what is the oldest aged muscalunge known in Ontario? Was it 15, 20, 30, or 50 years old? Interesting results. Uh, almost everyone's voted, maybe about three more seconds for anyone else. One, two, three. All right. The majority of people think that it was 30 years old, with a lot of other people thinking it was 50. Arunas, what's the answer? The answer is 30. Well done, everyone. <laughs> All right. Our next question. Um, that picture that we showed that had uh, that Aruna showed that had that muscalunge in it uh, We did mention it was caught somewhere in Georgian Bay and it was the oldest one. Where was It caught where did it originate from? We have Manitoulin Island Moon River Tobamori or Killarney Everyone is really quick on this one. <laughs> About five more seconds to take a guess. All right. So this one, uh, most people, almost 70% said Moon River. Arunas, I think that's the right answer. That is correct. Yeah, if we wanted to get specific, I think it was caught in Blackstone Harbor, was it not? Yes, you're correct. Um, all right, so we have two or three more questions. So this one gets into some of the technical. How can you distinguish a muskie from a northern pike? Um, it could be the number of mandibular pores, body coloration, shape of the tail fin, extent of scales on the cheek, or it could be all of these things. And if you don't know what all of these things are, we're going to talk about them. <laughs> so about four more seconds to take a guess on what the answer is. All right, so I'm gonna share these results. And the majority of people said all of the above, which whenever you see all of the above, <laughs> it's the right answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, question number six, this is my personal favorite. What is a hybrid between a muskie and a northern pike called? You could call it Mike, a muskie pikey, a northern pascalunge, a tiger muskie, or we're just tricking you and they actually can't interbreed. Everyone's taking a little more time with this one. Maybe about five more seconds to take a guess on what the hybrid is called. Okay, the majority of people have said tiger muskie, which is the correct answer. Um, so unfortunately for those who said they can't hybridize, it's actually not true, they can. Um, and we'll probably have a picture of that later on. For those of you that picked Mike, thank you. <laughs> um, and we have one final question. 
Again, pretty fun one. What was the stomach contents of the largest muscalunge that was caught? Um, did they find cormorant? Did they find white, white suckers, walleyes, pieces of muskrat, brown bullheads, or all of the above? <laughs> Really quick again. So about four more seconds for our last poll to take a guess. All right, so we're gonna share that. Most people said all of the above, um, which is quite funny. The answer was actually the brown bullheads, but that's probably just specific to the day that it was caught. Maybe I'm not sure. <laughs> we're gonna still let you talk to that, but. Um, brown bullheads was the answer. So those are our polls. So thanks for participating in that, everybody. Arunas, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. So now we have musky on the brain, which is good because we're going to get into some meaty stuff in the presentation. Now there must be a bit of a, a lag because I'm having a hard time advancing. There we go. So Muscalunge. When you consider muscalunge as a species, it's quite unique in that its distribution is much more constricted than a closely related species, the northern pike. This next slide shows a map of part of uh, North America showing the native distribution of muscalunge in lime green as well as yellow. And you can see that it's restricted to the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River watershed, as well as some inland lakes, uh, the upper Mississippi River and the Illinois River. So fairly limited distribution. And in those locations, it's also found in low abundance typically. And the yellow and the green indicate that there are believed to be two forms of muscalunge since the last glaciation. Those that are uh, riverine and have evolved sympatrically with northern pike and as a result have very distinct reproductive behavior as opposed to the lacustrine or small lake dwelling muscalunge which evolved asymptomatic uh, they evolved without northern, without northern pike present. So they have somewhat distinct reproductive behaviors that distinguish them from the riverine form. And you can see that in general, their distribution is quite limited when you compare to, it to the northern pike, delineate, delineated by that red line. And northern pike are circumpolar, so they're not just in the northern parts of Canada and the US. They're found throughout uh, Russia and Northern uh, Europe as well. So much more widely distributed. So the muscalunge is a unique kind of glacial relic that only is found in a fairly localized area in North America. It's distinguished from the Northern Pike and um, effort made to try to educate anglers and others interested in these two species on how to differentiate northern pike from muscalunge. Uh, one of the reasons is because the regulations, the angling regulations are quite distinct for northern pike and muscalunge. They're much more restrictive for muscalunge compared to northern pike. And it's important that the anglers are educated and knowledgeable about the differences. The Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry teamed up with uh, Muskies Canada, an organization that advocates on behalf of wild muskie populations in the province. In fact, uh, they have chapters throughout Canada. And they uh, put together a tabloid which was know how to tell the difference. And it features some of the unique characteristics of muscalunge and northern pike so that when one is angling, one can tell the difference between the two species and uh, act accordingly, either releasing or retaining uh, the fish, depending on what species it is. So 
for those who haven't had an opportunity to see muskellunge in the wild, this is a, a collage of photos taken from uh, individuals, individual muskellunge captured throughout Eastern Georgian, or Georgian Bay and the North Channel of Lake Huron. And you can see that they show a variety of color patterns rating from what's referred to as a clear pattern, like the individual on the top left. And then when you go below that individual, you see some other individuals that are having a clear color morph. And then you have the bar pattern in the individual at the bottom left, and then the individual on the top right. That's kind of referred to as the barred pattern. And then when you go down that column on the right, you see some adults displaying what's referred to as a spotted color morph. And you can see depending on where you are in the watershed, you have actually representation from all these different color morphs. And uh, right now we don't really have a clear understanding as to how those color morphs, morphs uh, are generated whether it's genetic, whether it's the environment that the fish finds themselves in, whether they're shallow or deep dwelling fish, but you can see that they do have distinct color morphs. When you look at juvenile muskie, uh, in particular young of the year, this is a collection of young of the year captured during a variety of assessment surveys. And you can see that their color patterns are a little more consistent. So these are fish that were captured throughout uh, parts of Georgian Bay in the North Channel. And you can see that their color morph is, is quite distinct with the light background and the barring. And it's, it's more consistent than what you see in the adults. And this is another way of distinguishing juvenile muskellunge from northern pike, which are encountered quite frequent, frequently in uh, particular surveys. So I'm going to delve more uh, deeply into the surveys that we've conducted in Lake Huron. And this map shows the known distribution of muskie populations throughout the watershed. You can see that there's concentrations along that littoral shelf in eastern Georgian Bay and up into the North Channel where the uh, populations are a little bit um, less concentrated and associated particularly with uh, river mounts. And there are some riverine populations, one in the Saugeen, and also a population that is uh, transitory in the southern part of the main basin of Lake Huron. And uh, this represents a fairly large area of shoreline, close to 400 kilometers as the raven flies, um, but much more lengthy shoreline when you consider the convoluted nature of the shoreline with all its embayments and unique shorelines and uh, over 30,000 islands. The catalyst for a lot of our work started as a result of the plight of the muskellunge population in the Spanish River area. It used to support a very abundant and robust population uh, back in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, and uh, that population was almost extirpated by the mid-1900s as a result of primarily environmental perturbations uh, affecting water quality in the Spanish River area. So there were efforts to try to determine whether it was feasible to try to reestablish muscalonge in the Spanish River. And that uh, prompted uh, the Upper Great Lakes Management Unit to consider determining what the status of muskie populations were in the basin. So a subset of populations were identified and sampled um, to determine their status and to determine whether there were suitable brood stocks available to try to replenish the Spanish River population. A number of these populations were selected for um, assessment and the collection of gametes from the wild uh, in order to do some restorative stocking for the Spanish River area. And I'm gonna highlight the Spanish River as a case study 
in uh, trying to restore a top predator to an ecosystem. And there are very few examples of this being successfully accomplished. And uh, I will state a case that supports the contention that we have successfully reestablished muscalunge in the Spanish River. So the source populations for uh, rehabilitative or restorative stocking was the Serpent River in the North Channel, uh, the Bay of Islands, McGregor Bay, the French River, and the Magnetowan River. This work was only possible through the establishment of partnerships. It was inspired by the Friends of the Spanish River, a non-for-profit organization that uh, was interested in restoring the ecological integrity of the Spanish River, as well as a myriad of other academic and government-based uh, organizations that uh, were essential in raising the profile of muscalunge and acquiring the financial resources and um, other um, assessment resources in order to conduct the myriad assessments that were required in order to get a restor restorative rehabilitation stocking program off the ground. So this slide just highlights some of the partners that have been involved with the Spanish River Muskie reintroduction, as well as the ongoing monitoring of muscalunge and muscalunge habitat uh, in Lake Huron. So I'm going to highlight the, our assessment program and uh, just give you a sense of what it involved and how uh, successful it was at establishing the status muscalunge populations throughout the watershed. So our muscalunge assessment started in 1996. It started experimentally using a live capture trap net gear. We didn't really have a program in which to model our assessment program from. There weren't a lot of efforts made at trying to establish the status of muscalunge throughout other jurisdiction. They're a very difficult species to capture. They're not found in large numbers and uh, most resource agencies just don't have the, the financial resources um, to dedicate to this particular species. So we have been able to conduct uh, spring musky index netting in 10 locations. Uh, we have accumulated 31 individual surveys and this musky survey uses live capture trap net gear set in close proximity to presumed muscalunge spawning areas, so coastal wetlands. And a lot of it is hit and miss, just trying to use our best professional judgment to determine where these adult fish are in the spring. And you only get a limited opportunity to encounter them during the spring spawning period, because most of the rest of the time, they are off in deep water and not necessarily accessible to our capture gear. We also conduct end of spring trap netting surveys, which is another standardized methodology using the same type of trap net gear, but it's um, used to monitor the composition and the characteristics of the nearshore fish community in a broad sense. So it doesn't just cover spawning habitat for muscalunge, it covers a variety of uh, shoreline areas and the nets are randomly set along the shoreline to get a, a broad picture of the fish community. And we also incidentally capture some muscalunge during what we refer to as spring walleye index netting. And again, these are trap nets set in riverine habitats close to where walleye are spawning in the spring. And uh, we do encounter the odd uh, spawning muscalunge as well during these surveys. And you can see that we've covered 12 locations and 23 surveys over the years. Some of the information that we've garnered from these surveys are insights into the behavior behavioral characteristics of musclelunge. So this next graph shows the spawning periodicity of musclelunge for both males in blue and females in green. And you could see the surface temperatures in Celsius and in Fahrenheit degrees on the uh, X axis. And basically what the take home message from this slide is that musclelunge are captured over a broad range of temperatures. Um, as low as five to six degrees Celsius and as warm as 22 to 23 degrees Celsius. 
And you could see that there's a broad peak in activity for both males and females from about nine degrees to 17 degrees. And this is in contrast to a lot of other spring spawners like walleye and northern pike that uh, have a much more truncated spawning um, duration and a much more limited thermal range. Muscalunge can spawn over a one to two month period. And in large lake systems like Lake Huron in Georgian Bay in the North Channel, there is some speculation that there are fractional spawners that they spawn more than once in a given year. Now we don't have a lot of evidence for this because most of our surveys do not span the entire spawning period, but we have had glimpses of evidence to suggest that muscalunch may spawn more than once within a given spring. This next slide shows the average catch rate of muscalunch throughout a number of areas sampled in our surveys. And the take home message here is that catch rates are quite low, typically less than one fish per net night. And you can see that uh, in the catch rates are variable. In some locations, we've had multiple years of effort, but in many locations, we've only had one year of effort just to get a glimpse of whether muscalunge are actually present in a location or not. So it's not a very comprehensive program. And as I said before, muscalunge in the management realm aren't necessarily strong on the radar screen. A lot of our resources are dedicated to other species of more economic importance, per se, like walleye and lake trout and whitefish. And you just don't have the allocation of resources to uh, dedicate to muscalunge. The other take home message from this slide is that, you know, certain areas like the Magnetowan River is quite special. It supports a fairly large population of muscalunge, relatively speaking and we have fairly consistent catch rates in that area. Now many of you might be wondering what are those arrows pointing at? Well they indicate locations in which we've done back-to-back -back surveys of spawning muscalunge one year to the next and inevitably the second year of two consecutive years of surveys the catch rates are much lower and this um, reflects Again, another attribute of the species that makes it very hard to monitor and assess. They become net shy or they uh, avoid nets uh, actively. So when we capture them the initial year, we usually process them, measure them, and tag them with an external tag. And uh, we have evidence that they actually avoid nets the subsequent year, particularly the large females. So it makes it very difficult to get an accurate picture of population abundance in these areas because the fish tend to avoid our capture nets. So I'm going to talk a bit about biology and again it's not hard to find impact slides when presenting on muscalunge in our area. This is a picture of a large female muscalunge captured in Arnold's Bay in the Moon River area and uh, there's quite a story that goes with this muscalunge but I just don't have time to get into it. But for those of you who are really interested, send me an email and, and I'll give you some insights into this fascinating story about this particular fish. So muscalunch females typically are much larger than males. On average, 47 inches and about 30 pounds. And I apologize for the imperial units. Uh, I use them because most anglers that are passionate about muscalunch are fixated about inches and pounds. Those that want a metric uh, conversion, I can provide them to you on request. So we have muscalunge, these are spawning muscalunge. Uh, the interesting observation has been that over 30% of the female mature muscalunge captured in our surveys are 50 inches or greater. And that 50 inches is significant in that that's kind of the gold standard established by musky anglers. Uh, if you catch a musky that's 50 inches or greater, then that's pretty substantial fish and noteworthy. The largest fish that we've captured has been a 56 inch individual that weighed over 52 pounds. Although we can't age musky the way you can other species by scales, uh, it's difficult to get a good and accurate um, indication of musky age unless you take a particular bone 
in the pectoral girdle called the clythrum bone. And that clythrum bone uh, has uh, growth lines like you see on a tree with the growth rings and you can get a fairly accurate age assessment. Now we don't age our fish because we live release the fish. You couldn't live release a fish that had its clythrum removed. But there is a database established in the province called the clythrum database. And it's clythrum bones that have been provided by anglers on a volunteer basis. Those that have caught large individuals can contribute that bone to the Ministry of Natural Resources. And uh, Dr. John Castleman has been involved with aging these fish. And if you look at the database that's been acquired since the 1960s for Georgian Bay in the North Channel, a fish that is 47 inches in total length is about 14 years old. So relatively old fish, when you consider the uh, uh, spawning age of other species that could be you know, three to five years of age. So these fish are old, large, when they start to spawn in a large ecosystem like that in Eastern Jordan's Bay and uh, the North Channel. So there must be some adaptive significance to be large to spawn in a large ecosystem like Georgian Bay and the North Channel. Males on average are 40 inches or about 17 pounds, and we've only ever captured one 50 inch male. Most of them are much smaller, and uh, uh, it's just the, the nature of this uh, particular species where the females reach a much larger size and uh, develop a large complement of eggs as a result. You can see our, our sample sizes are, are quite substantial when you uh, consider all the areas that have been sampled. So uh, just over a thousand fish have been sampled to date. And those musky males on average are about 10 years of age uh, when they are found on the spawning ground. So that's pretty old as well compared to other species. If we look at the size characteristics of muscalunge, uh, this is a slide showing the average size of males in blue and females in green. And it also has the uh, maximum size of males in blue, in a blue dash and a green dash for maximum size of females across a fairly large geographic area. So stretching from Severn Sound to the Serpent Harbor in the North Channel. And the take home message from this slide is that across that large geographic area, the size characteristics of muscalunge are quite comparable across this area. So females and males on average are very similar in size, basically indicating that they have foraging opportunities and habitat characteristics that are conducive to producing large fish. And you can see for the females that the maximum size is um, uh, exceeds 50 inches in um, all the locations that have been sampled. So the area represented by the east coast of Georgian Bay and the North Panel produces large female muscalunge that are much sought after by recreational anglers. We all have information from one particular area that in Severn Sound in the southern part of uh, Georgian Bay where we have uh, surveys that span a 20-year period and the reason why I'm showing you the average size of males and females and their maximum sizes is to get some sense whether there has been change over time to the size characteristics of muscalunge. This slide shows that there really is no indication that uh, the average size of males and females has changed over this 20 year period. If muscalunge weren't reproducing successfully, you may have a trend towards larger individuals because no juveniles appearing in the population. But so far, based on the time frame and the amount of effort we've invested, there doesn't seem to be an indication that the size characteristics of muscalunge has changed dramatically uh, since we've been surveying that area in 1998. So just a summary of our assessment program, we've captured over a thousand muscalunge. We've tagged over 900 individuals. Most of the fish were captured during the targeted netting in the spring for muscalunge and some from our broad fish community surveys and um, few from our spring walleye index netting surveys. 14% of the fish that were tagged have been recaptured in trap nets. About 8% of the fish that we tagged have been recaptured by anglers. 
Uh, most of the fish have been recaptured once, but some individuals have been recaptured uh, greater than four, not four times. So some uh, just have a propensity for getting recaptured. Um, the tags, these experiments tend to stay on these fish for a long period of time. We've had one individual that was recaptured 17 years after its in initial tagging event. So these tags tend to stay on muscalunge more than they do in other species that uh, use the same type of tags. We can get a cursory look at average annual growth rate for females, it's uh, just over an inch in length per year. And in males, it's uh, slightly less. So females tend to grow faster than males, generally speaking. I'm gonna highlight the Spanish River as a case study. And I know I don't have a lot of time, but I'll just provide you with uh, an overview. The Spanish River has a lot of wetland, coastal wetland habitat, historically supported, substantial musky population, in fact, there was actually a commercial harvest of muscalunge in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Tens of thousands of kilos of muscalunge were commercially harvested during that time. That fishery was closed in the 1930s. There was a large pulp mill established upriver in Espanola, and that uh, pulp mill contributed to water quality declines in the river proper. And by the 1970s and 80s, a lot of the wood debris being discharged from the pulp mill was uh, suffocating a lot of the coastal wetlands that were present in the Spanish River Delta. And then there was a toxic spill, a sewage spill in the early 1980s that resulted in a major fish kill and basically spelt the demise of muscalunge in the Spanish River. So ever since it was designated as an area of concern in the early 1980s, uh, remedial efforts were made to try to improve water quality in the Spanish and to improve the characteristics of the habitat, particularly the coastal wetlands. And over time, just through every spring freshet, a lot of that woody debris has been washed away from the wetlands. The water quality has in improved substantially. And since 1999, the um, Spanish River has been designated as an area in recovery, and it was deemed to be healthy enough to try to reestablish muscalunge. So I mentioned that we identified a number of brood sources in Georgian Bay and the North Channel to try to culture uh, muscalunge uh, and stock them back into the Spanish River. This is the chronology of stocking events and locations from 1996 to 2003, so eight years worth of stocking both fall fingerling and yearling muscalunge. And you can see that the numbers were quite modest. You know, a good year would be 2,500 fall fingerlings. And when you consider that we stock hundreds of thousands of lake trout and tens of thousands of walleye in some areas, these numbers are quite modest. And the assurance that they would actually survive uh, was uh, uncertain to say the least. So in total, just under 9,000 fall fingerlings were stocked and uh, just over 1,300 spring yearlings. And a number of assessments were conducted to see whether that stocking had any success. Uh, one of the methods was using electrofishing, which is the boat you see on the bottom left. And this uh, survey was done in the late summer when uh, young of the year muscalunge are quite accessible and are partially or temporarily stunned uh, through this survey type and dip netted out of the river to see whether they are re muscalunge are reproducing or not. This next slide shows that in 2010, a fairly comprehensive survey using electrofishing uh, encountered young of the year muscalunge throughout the lower Spanish River from Webwood on down. And this was very gratifying. It basically indicated that muscalunge were successfully reproducing in the Spanish River where they hadn't been observed for over 30 years. And you could see by the different colors of dots that there were good numbers of uh, young of the year muscalunge captured throughout a large stretch of river. That's over 40 kilometers of river. So that was a very good sign. And that was in 2010 evidence in 2005 
that uh, Musculunch were reproducing and producing ear classes. So it's been over a decade now, close to two decades, in which Musculunch are successfully reproducing in the Spanish River. And we're seeing even more evidence of that in some recent surveys targeting Musculunch as well as uh, spawning walleye. This is just a depiction of some large adult Musculunch captured throughout the river. So the Spanish River is showing strong signs of population recovery, which is quite amazing. And it's happened over about a two decade period. And it was through the collective efforts of organizations like the Friends of the Spanish, uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources, uh, Ministry of Environment, and others that have been involved with trying to remediate the ecological health of the Spanish River. So I'm going to talk a bit about genetics. We've been able to get genetic insights from the various populations that we've sampled over the years. Dr. Chris Wilson has been uh, involved with uh, genetic, genetically characterizing tissue samples collected from adult musculunch through a variety of locations that we've sampled. And uh, it's always um, scary territory to try to describe the results of genetic surveys uh, to a layperson. Now, I'm going to try my best and basically try to give you a take home message that uh, you can understand. So I have a map depicting the various locations in which tissue samples were collected from adult musculunge that usually consist of a, a scale sample or a small piece of the caudal fin of an individual. And these tissue samples are basically genetically finger fingerprinted uh, using uh, microsatellite DNA as the, uh, the marker type. And the bottom slide, the bottom uh, graph, and the various colors basically show the fingerprint or the genetic identity of individuals from each of those populations. And when you have different colors, that means their genetic fingerprint is distinct from the other populations that are being surveyed. So for instance, on the left-hand side, the Serpent River very distinct population, kind of that orangey brown. And when you look at individuals from the Bay of Islands, they're depicted in that red with a bit of blue. They're very distinct from the Serpent River. And then McGregor Bay is predominantly characterized by individuals highlighted by the blue color. And as you go across that graph, you can see all the various source populations are quite distinct. So these genetic, these populations of musculunge are very special. They're genetically distinct, they're discrete. These adults don't move very far. They tend to stay in one location and home back to specific coastal wetlands. So if you lose a coastal wetland in one specific area, you may lose that very unique uh, genetic population of musculunge that's locally adapted to that particular area. So this was actually quite a surprising result because those adults can move long distances, yet they choose not to, particularly since the last glaciation. And they show additional regional structure. So there are populations that are considered uh, part of the northern grouping of uh, Muscalunge and uh, northern Georgian Bay, the North Channel and southern Georgian Bay. So you can see that there are um, substructures to these populations. They're all unique, but they also have some regional substructure. So you can see Severn Sound is more closely related to Gloucester Pool, but are distinct from the Moon River and the Point of Barrel that are considered Northern Georgian Bay type of populations. And then you have the North Channel grading into the French River Delta area and McGregor Bay. So quite interesting insights into the genetics of Muscalunge. The Spanish River did that restorative or rehabilitation study. It's hard to say a population Yes. Is there a question? I can see you. I see the video. Um, so how am I doing for time? Uh, 
No, you're doing great. There was just some feedback there, but it might be on my end. I'm not sure. Can you um, hear me okay now? Yes, it's better now. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Because I'm getting into some complex stuff here. So if you look at a brood source level of genetic characterization and look at how distinct these populations are that were stocked into the Spanish River, you see that Northern Georgian Bay are very distinct from Northern all brood sources of uh, Muscogee represented by um, the uh, McGregor Bay, Bay of Islands and Serpent River populations. And then you could see that juveniles collected from the Spanish River are quite distinct from these other population groupings. So it appears as though the Spanish River juveniles are a distinct genetic entity from the source populations that were stocked on the Spanish River. So there may have been a residual population of adult muscalunge that persisted in the Spanish that we just weren't able to encounter because of their low abundance. And that seems to be what's responsible for the uh, successful year classes of juveniles produced in recent years. However, when you look at an individual basis and look at individual fingerprinting, you see that in this upper graph, you have Magnetowan River and French River Delta kind of clustering in one area. You've got the Serpent River Bay of Islands and McGregor Bay in another cluster. And then you have um, individuals uh, from the Spanish River uh, represented by adults and juveniles that kind of grade into each other. So basically what the take home message here is that there is some evidence of genetic material in the juveniles produced recently in the Spanish River that originate from other sources, like the French River Delta, like the Magnetowan River and the Bay of Islands. So there's some indication that the fish that were stocked during that eight year period, some of them have grown into adults and have successfully reproduced and produced young of the year in the Spanish River area. So there are some indications that that restorative stocking has proved beneficial in contributing to some extent to the resurgence of natural reproduction in the Spanish River. So quite good news. I'm gonna move on to habitat. We've had a very productive relationship with McMaster University, in particular, uh, Dr. Pat Chow Fraser and a number of her graduate students that um, have been looking at coastal wetlands, their uh, uh, vegetation and their physical structure and the fish community present in these coastal wetlands. And we've been able to garner interest from Pat to look at the attributes of wetlands as they relate to reproductive and nursery habitats for muscalunge. So a number of graduate students have been involved with uh, monitoring and tracking adult spawning muscalunge as they frequent coastal wetlands throughout Severn Sound in Southern Georgian Bay and up in the Northern part of uh, Georgian Bay in the Beaverstone Bay area. So a lot of this work has provided us with insights into what characterizes productive coastal wetlands both spawning and nursery habitat for muscalunge. And uh, I've indicated at the end of this presentation some uh, published reports that have uh, given some detail and insights into what makes a coastal wetland function properly for spawning muscalunge. And it has to do with the type of vegetation, the type of fish community found in the area, the density of vegetation, the slope and the depth, and the exposure of these coastal wetlands. So you need a unique combination of these elements to produce successful spawning locations for muscalunge. And they aren't necessarily widespread. There are distinct wetlands that function uh, to support natural reproduction of muscalunge, but it varies depending on lake levels. And we've gone through a 20 year period of extremes in lake levels, uh, partially associated with changing climate regimes and global warming. And we had that period of time from 1999 to 2013 in which we saw very low lake levels in Georgian Bay and the rest of Lake Huron. 
and that basically translated in reduced reproductive output for muscalinge in a number of locations, in particular areas that have shallow slopes, Severn Sound. I mentioned that uh, adults, adult muscalunge were captured during our assessment programs and they were provided to the graduate students from the University of, from McMaster University and they were implanted with uh, radio tags in order to monitor their movements during the spring spawning period. And just a, a little anecdote here, we several times uh, were checking our nets to see whether we captured uh, adult muscalunge and we were frustrated by our lower catch rates that we were experiencing. And we had a crew from McMaster out several times and they could get a pretty good reading on where these musky were. And in several cases, they indicated the presence of muscalunch in close proximity to our nets, but these fish would not actually go into our nets. So they were frequenting areas in which they spawned the previous year, but they were notoriously elusive and not um, being captured in our set gear. I don't have a lot of time to uh, get into the details of this research, but basically it established that muscalunge during the spawning period have very discrete areas that they frequent, and they tend to return to specific spawning locations from year to year. So they show a high degree of spawning site fidelity. So females and males will go to a specific location year after year. And we've had several occasions where we've caught, captured a pair of muscalunge, a male and a female, tagged them, and subsequent, subsequently recaptured them in the same location, and in some cases, to the same day of the year, a year later, which indicates that there might be some pair bonding going on with muscalunge, adult muscalunge, which you don't see very much in the fish world. Uh, the researchers at McMaster have been able to create a vulnerability index map showing areas of wetlands that are vulnerable to low lake levels. And uh, this should prove useful moving forward in trying to establish areas that uh, may need to be managed in a different way when we have persistent low lake levels. And just to get an overall sense of the resiliency and the adaptability of musky, musky populations throughout eastern Georgian Bay. I'm nearing the end, so I just wanted to make a statement as I have my impact slide back on for the future of muskie. As I indicated, muskie aren't necessarily on the radar screen for managers, and we've really had to try to raise the profile of the species in order to allocate resources to determine its current status over the years. And uh, it's been a struggle, and we've relied on external partners to raise the profile of the species because when you get right down to it, muscalunge are a barometer for the health of coastal wetlands. They're obligate wetland spawners. Their health is dictated by the health of coastal wetlands. They're an apex predator, and they're a unique part of the biodiversity within our lake and deserve some attention. So we've got a foundation of peer-reviewed literature that has give, given us insights into the genetics of monkey in our watershed. Uh, we've got some indication of their habitat requirements and just uh, information on general biology and distribution of musk muscalunge throughout Lake Huron. We've had partnerships in the past. This is a pamphlet that we produced in partnership with Muskies Canada. It's been out of print for over 10 years now, but it was an effort to try to raise the profile of muscalunge and just let the general public know, know how special this particular species is and that's how, how special this resource is and how vulnerable it is to environmental perturbations. So it would be nice if we could um, reprint this particular pamphlet that gives a pretty good overview of the status of muscalunge and identifying it from uh, Northern Pike and just its general role in the ecology of the lake. We've been involved with um, and a partner in efforts to restore uh, muscalunge in Lake Simcoe, but that is a story for another time. I wish I could give you some sense of what's been going on in Lake Simcoe. It's a multi-year effort to try to restore muscalunge that were at one time quite abundant in Lake Simcoe and uh, 
have precipitously declined uh, to more recent years. What may affect Muscalunge in the future? Coastal wetlands are critical. When we went through that uh, low lake period, a lot of the nursery and spawning habitat was no longer functioning. Round goby have now invaded a lot of the coastal wetlands and have been uh, uh, determined to be a very effective egg predator. So they eat the eggs of uh, muscalunge that spawn in these coastal, wet coastal wetlands. And in areas like Severn Sound, goby are quite prominent and prevalent in these coastal wetlands and likely affect the productivity of muscalunge populations. And we also have the specter of ongoing shoreline development. We have wetlands that are still being lost as a result of indiscriminate and unwise uh, shoreline alterations that, as I mentioned earlier, are critical because if you lose a particular wetland, you, use a, you lose a particular population of muscalunge. I wanted to finish by acknowledging a lot of people that have been involved with collecting the information, summarizing it, and contributing to our efforts to establish the status of muscalunge. Anyone that's participated in this program has um, uh, benefited from the experience. And uh, I hope that uh, through this presentation, I've been able to give you some insights into the status of muscalunge and the role that they play in the ecology of Lake Huron. So with that, I'm gonna end my presentation. Uh, there is one additional slide I have at the end. Uh, that I could uh, present um, for Katrina, or I can entertain questions if we have time for questions. Katrina has asked that we go right to the questions. There are some really good ones. Um, and I just wanna acknowledge the time. We might lose a few people now that it's noon. The timing is really perfect on this. Um, but if you can stay, we have some great questions. Um, that we're gonna ask Arunas um, and I'm going to go through them just in the order that I received them. So Arunas, right now we have about seven and there's a couple more trickling in. Um, early on, Jane asked, um, she said that it was really uh, interesting that pike are circumpolar and muskie are a little bit more, um, or a little smaller distribution. So I'm wondering if they're known by a different name somewhere else. The are thought to be different um, species of northern pike throughout its range. Now, I'm not sure whether they're considered subspecies, um, and I think they are subspecies of northern pike throughout uh, Asia and Russia. Uh, so it's still considered uh, northern pike or one species, but there are subspecies where there are some differentiation in certain characteristics characteristics of the northern pike throughout that circumpolar area. But for uh, muscalunge, it's pretty well established that they are the same species with different color morphs and certain behaviors that are related to uh, whether they evolved in sympatry or allopatry with northern pike. Allopatry was the word I couldn't remember earlier on in my presentation. So my apologies. Um, wondering also, next question, was the Government of Canada, any federal agencies involved in the project um, in any way? Um, peripherally, the Environment Canada was involved in the remediation effort on the Spanish River. Um, so they were involved with uh, programs related to improving water quality and characterizing uh, fish habitat in a general sense. So they were instrumental in improving habitat and environmental conditions in the Spanish that allowed the prospects for muscalunge reintroduction to occur. But in terms of the general assessment and monitoring, um, there hasn't been a lot of federal involvement up until recently where we have had federal funding through the Great Lakes funding pool uh, in, uh, on Lake Huron. So there has been some federal funds available for uh, some of our monitoring activities in recent years. 
Um, we have two questions, one from Rick and one from Brooks, uh, asking similar things about the record high water levels and what yes. that's going to have on coastal wetlands for breeding, spawning, and nursery habitat too. Well, well hopefully it will expand the extent of nursery and spawning habitat for this particular species. Uh, for for areas like Severn Sound that are characterized by moderate sloping shorelines, uh, they that area is affected by uh, lake level changes. When you have higher lake levels, you access areas that are more steeply sloping, and you rejuvenate the composition of aquatic vegetation. So you create more diverse um, underwater structure for vegetation. So presumably that will result in enhanced opportunities for reproduction for muscolunge. Okay. Um, a question from Braden, and you did talk about uh, this a little bit because you did ask the longest muskie the, the program has recorded. I think you said that was 56 inches. Uh, yeah. And so secondary question is, do you believe that muskie can break 60 inches? Could that be caught? Of course. And I'll suggest that it'll happen in Georgian Bay. Um, we've had many anecdotal accounts of anglers either encountering fish that are in that 60 inch range um, or observing fish that were reputed to be of that size stature. Our nets are comprised of a trap with a funnel that leads into a box compartment. And some of these larger muskie may be just too large to fit through that funnel. So we, we may not get some of the very large specimens that are out there, but those 60 inch plus fish are quite unique and very rare. Like they're a very special fish to be able to survive and persist and not get angled and retained. And you know, it takes decades for them to reach that size. So I always like to be optimistic and put out that, yeah, there are big fish out there just to keep those anglers engaged. And, and they know that uh, Georgian Bay is such a large ecosystem that there are probably areas of the bay that have never been fished for muskonge. So there's likely a very large individual out there ready to be encountered. Awesome. A uh, question from Larry. Uh, is there any research on the impact of cormorant predation on fingerlings, um, i.e. are they a source of food, are muskie a source of food for cormorants? I would be surprised because they're quite cryptic, elusive, and very low in abundance. And they tend to stay in close proximity to these coastal wetlands. Cormorants are looking for easy prey, stuff that's really abundant and accessible. So, you know, I can't rule it out because I know that cormorants have been observed to predate upon juvenile northern pike but I would be surprised if muskie were a regular feature of their diet. I can only hope because they're really not very abundant. Okay. Um, so a question about some of the genetic work. Um, what is the potential impact of stocking non-distinct genetic fish in genetically distinct populations, i.e. do you lose certain traits that were unique to that distinct population? That's an excellent question, and that's always a, a concern and a consideration when you're trying to rehabilitate or restore populations. And uh, because, you know, the prevailing um, theory for genetics is that you develop distinct characteristics, that these are through local adaptations, and they make individuals fit better in their local environment than if you introduce individuals from a, a novel environment. And what happens if you get hybridization or introgression, you lose some of these locally adapted characteristics and that could have consequences for future survival of that particular population. 
So in terms of the Spanish River, there was, we just could not encounter any adults or evidence of juveniles in the system. And that's why the decision was made to try to jumpstart that population. Um, and apparently there were some residual individuals left there. And um, all indications are that they still are the predominant genetic fingerprint in that area, that there's been some um, contribution from these external populations. But th those external populations were selected based upon their locality and their habitat type. So they're not that distant from the Spanish and they occupy habitats that are quite similar to what would have been occupied in the Spanish River. So hopefully that will mitigate some of the impacts of introgression. Awesome. We still have about five more questions. Um, there are a couple of people wondering though about uh, the Lake Simcoe restocking program. And I'm wondering um, if there is a link or a document that we can send out um, specific to that story. I can access one and make it available for our summary because it's a very, very fascinating story and it's still evolving. Uh, I don't think they've seen evidence of success like we have in the Spanish, but maybe it's just a matter of time. All right. Um, so a question from Rob, uh, it reads, what are what is the overall recruitment looking like for Southern Georgian Bay? Is there an upward or downward trend on the whole? Again, we don't have a lot of consistent data collection in that area. Um, some of the surveys that we've done in recent years in the Severn Sound area suggest that there's still recruitment occurring. We've encountered juveniles and fairly good numbers of adult fish. Um, some of the work done by uh, Pat Chow Fraser's lab, uh, they've done some seining for young of the year in recent years, and they've had a hard time encountering any juvenile muscalunge. So when we had those low lake levels, it seemed to uh, result in very little evidence of natural reproduction occurring in Severn Sound. So with a long-lived species, there's usually a lag period between lack of reproduction and actually being able to establish it through our monitoring efforts. So we may see a decline in the number of adults moving forward. Um, hopefully that'll be offset by recent increases in lake levels since 2014. There's still a population of spawning muscalunge in that area, so hopefully the conditions and the newly acquired expanded spawning habitat will result in stronger year classes. So it's hard to give a definitive answer. Uh, there definitely was some evidence of reduced recruitment, but hopefully with the current conditions, uh, that might improve over time. Okay, okay we have about five more questions that have uh, come in. So from your angler caught recaps, can you recall how far some of the fish were caught later in the season from their original trap net location? That's a good question. Um, we've been, I'm still in the process of summarizing that information. Um, generally speaking, when it was a male that was recaptured, it was fairly close to its original tagging location. So within a kilometer, let's say. So male home territories are fairly small. When it was a female, usually larger fish, usually they were much further away from their original tagging location. So five to 10 kilometers in some cases. So females, because they're larger, more energy demand, they tend to have a home territory that's much larger than males from the little uh, insights we've gained from recaptured fish. All right, a question came in on the chat from Lexi. Um, scales are not a super accurate way to determine age. Uh, just wondering if you're collecting scales at all. The only reason why we collect scales is because they're used for genetic analysis. So there's enough epidermal tissue on the scale sample to use for genetic characterization. Those scales are not useful for aging. And as I mentioned, the only accurate way to age a muscalunge is through that clythrum bone. 
and the only way you can get it is through mortality. So we've had a few mortalities over the years and we have retained those clythrum bones and aged them. So we do have a data repository for muscular age by clythrum. Um, but with scales, really they're only effective for juveniles and, and young muscalunge. So they are collected, but primarily for genetic characterization. A uh, question from Larry, very interesting. Um, Arunas, you'd mentioned that the invasive round goby eat muscalunge eggs. Do larger muskie prey on goby, or is there no natural enemy of the goby? That's a good question. So we haven't had an opportunity to see the stomach contents from very many muskie because in our live capture surveys, we release them. In some of our gill netting surveys, they're just so rarely encountered. Uh, the few times that we have encountered them, we haven't um, witnessed any ground goby. But I qualify that statement. Most of the predatory species in the bay, the shallow water species, like walleye, northern pike, um, channel catfish, all of them have been observed to have round goby in their stomachs. So round goby are being consumed by a broad range of predators, including smallmouth and large, largemouth bass. So they are being consumed, and I would assume that muscalunge would also be consuming them as well. So whether they consume enough to offset the number of gobies that are out there, not likely. It's uh, just one of those things that uh, we have to deal with. One of the other things that I didn't have a chance to mention in my talk was the association between round goby, VHS virus, and muscalunge mortality. In the St. Lawrence River, they've lost over half of their adult muscalunge because of VHS, which is a virus that affects a number of species like uh, muscalunge, resulting in mortality of large adults. And goby are a carrier of this virus. And when species like muskie consume goby, they may acquire this virus. So we don't have any, any evidence in Georgian Bay that there's been any mortality events related to this VHS virus. But it's something that we should be aware of in the future because it could have a major impact on the dynamics of muskie populations. Um. All right, we're down to our last two questions uh, from Brandon. Has there been any studies on muskie specifically in the Big Sound? Was that a part of the program at all? In the Big Sound? Yeah, Perry Sound. No, not specifically in the Perry Sound area. Uh, we don't know whether there are any substantial coastal wetland spawning locations there. Of course, to the south is part of the Moon River Delta complex. Spider Bay and Clear Bay, but uh, we've never sampled in the Perry Sound area. But if that individual knows of specific coastal wetlands that they've observed muscalunge spawning, we would definitely be interested in, in hearing about that. Okay. We should have people put their fish on iNaturalist when they do catch them. Um, an email. Uh, so finally from Sean, was any study work done in the autumn um, or is their distribution too varied? I didn't, was that, what was that again? Can you repeat that? Yep. Was any of the study done in the autumn or the fall or is their distribution too varied at that time of year? Yeah, we haven't targeted muskie in the fall specifically. Uh, we've got a gill netting program that's called the Fall Walleye Index Netting Program. And it targets aggregations of walleye and I guess other near shore fish species. And we do encounter the odd muscalunge uh, in that survey type. But again, they're widely distributed and rarely encountered. And some of the large fish are net, we're, are, are net um, averse. So they can actively try to avoid some of our net sets. So that's another complicating feature. So really the springtime is the only time you get to a chance to see any numbers of adult muscalunge. And then there are different surveys like the electrofishing survey in the summer for juveniles that can be effective. 
Just really quickly, Arunas, uh, was any of the program done in the Boyne River? No. Okay. Good answer. <laughs> Awesome. Well, that is all the questions. Thank you to everyone who submitted a question. Thank you to everyone who's still on the line and uh, was able to hear the whole webinar. Um, fantastic to have you be able to join us. And I'm really glad the power didn't go out because the weather's here and I've been really worried about that the whole time, but that didn't happen. So a huge thank you, virtual round of applause to Arunas for your time and, and for sharing all of this. Um, the question that's on the last slide about lake sturgeon, I'll include that information in the follow-up email and you can be in touch with us um, if you have seen a lake sturgeon that's related to some other work that the biosphere is going to be doing. Um, yeah, so once again, thank you and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day and happy fishing too. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. It was great. And hopefully you could hear me throughout. Yeah. There was the one moment where it was weird, but it went away. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. Have a good day.